in time. The secret is out. The Reverend David Loos is the candidate for president of the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. As a member of the search committee, I am thrilled that the Reverend Dr. David Lose was chosen for this position. He will be on campus Tuesday and Wednesday. Please go to the website. It's being posted for when he will be speaking. The board will be voting on this position uh, the afternoon of uh, Wednesday, May 14th. And um, so follow that along. The search committee com consisted of 12 people and um, Dr. John Richter was here yesterday. He was the head of the search committee and did a marvelous job, as did Carrie Schwab, kept us all informed and kept us on track. And uh, many excellent candidates were interviewed, and uh, Dr. Loos was our final choice. It is really only by coincidence, ha-ha, uh, that he is speaking with us today. It would be hard to nab him that fast. But he is here um, because of uh, working with the Kairos organization as we look toward a uh, funding campaign for the Southeast Pennsylvania Synod. But first, let me say a few words about Dr. Lose. Would you come up to the podium at this point so they can see you while we're talking about you? While I'm talking about you. <laughs> Get used to that in this Synod. But we, when we talk about you, we have you right up front. We don't talk behind your back, we talk right to you. So, yeah, over, over to the podium. Where are you going to be speaking? Oh, you're going to speak for him. Yeah, okay, good. Um, he's professor of homiletics at Luther Seminary in Minneapolis and the former dean of Luther. He is a graduate of the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. And he earned his doctorate at Princeton Theological Seminary. So some of you who thought he was in the Midwest, you're going to see some of his eastern roots here. He served three congregations in New Jersey before joining the faculty at Luther in 2000. He currently serves as the director of the Center for Biblical Preaching, and in that capacity led the creative teams that developed workingpreacher.org and Sermon Brainwave. And I know many of you, you use that. Got some fans. David is the author of Making Sense of Scripture, a book that helps everyday Christians read the Bible with greater understanding and enjoyment, Confessing Jesus Christ, Preaching in a Postmodern World, which was listed one of the top 10 books of 2004. He's a popular speaker, he's lectured, and he's led workshops all over the country and internationally. And recently he's been working as a consultant with Kairos and Associates and is in that capacity that he speaks with us today. With the approval of the Synod Council, we engaged Kairos to conduct a deep listening and feasibility study for our Synod as we discerned the time and the place and the season for a synodical capital campaign. Since February, our Synod Council, the staffs, the deans, and other constituents met with Jeff Chalberg, who's the owner of Kairos, and with David Loos. More than a thousand landscape surveys, electronic surveys, went out to key rostered leaders and lay leaders on our synod territory. The online survey, consisting of more than 60 multiple choice questions, were tabulated as part of a very sophisticated feasibility instrument to determine energy in our synod for such a campaign. I also hosted two bishop summits with key leaders from our synod and engaged synod stakeholders in deep listening in hopes of uh, discerning if this is the right time. Today, da da David Lose will give us an overview of the results of the landscape survey, his and Jeff's reflections on the listening posts and the interviews that were conducted, and um, we're looking forward to that. I must also say, just so you can put it on your calendar now, 
that David Loes and Renee Leah Broughton will be our presenters at this year's Bishop Convocation. So, um, another holy coincidence. Uh, November, so put it on your calendars, November 12th, uh, 13th, and 14th. The theme is Creating gener Generations of Generosity on stewardship and living an abundant life. Creating Generations of Generosity. Join us uh, at that time, but I want to welcome and thank and bless David Lowe's. I'll take my stuff away. Just want to check whether the slides are working. It should be there. Um, it's not reading. Okay. It's not picking it up though at all. You need to change your resolution to 1024. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yep, that should be good. Good? Okay. Good morning. <laughs> I, uh, I stand before you as one somewhat identity challenged. <laughs> Grateful for the last 14 years of teaching at Luther Seminary with wonderful colleagues and students and involved in a number of projects and research, part of which I reported you to last night. Absolutely thrilled and honored and humbled to even contemplate walking in the footsteps of my teacher and good friend, Phil Cray. And having spent the last year working with Kairos and Associates in your Synod leadership, and it's in that capacity that I want to report to you um, today where we are at and where we go. I want to begin, though, with a story. I've told this story a number of times around the church because I find it to be a parable and a portent of our times today. It's not my story. It's the story of a friend of mine by the name of Raleigh Martinson, who for a number of years taught children, youth, and family ministry at Luther, and in that capacity traveled all over the globe making presentations, helping people think about how to be faithful in ministry to those in the first third of life. Raleigh was on the airplane uh, back from a conference in Australia. He sat down beside a gentleman he said was about my age at the time um, and decided to engage him in conversation and by asking him a question. Now, if you know Raleigh, this makes sense. Raleigh is uh, the extrovert's extrovert. <laughs> he is insatiably curious and he loves the church. So he turned and he asked this traveling companion a question that I would never, and I bet you would never think of asking in the church. He turned and said, hi, my name's Raleigh Martinson. Do you go to church? <laughs> right, when I'm on the plane, I'm having something different run through my head, a little mantra that goes like this. Please don't ask me what I do. Please don't ask me what I do. Please don't ask me what I do. <laughs> like for just a little while, I'd really like to leave the problems of the church literally 30,000 feet below. <laughs> but not Raleigh. Do you go to church? The guy's totally unfazed. He answers immediately, you know, we've always gone to church, but lately we've been thinking about stopping. And Raleigh says, tell me about that. And he does. He talked about a family, a young family, two kids in school, always gone to church, and suddenly they find themselves overwhelmed by the number of opportunities and obligations between commitments to school and church and work and social and on the brink of burnout. And so one Sunday before this gentleman's work took him to Australia, they sat down after church and had what in our family we call a family council. In our household, we usually are setting bedtimes and allowances and chores. This family made a list of all the obligations and opportunities they had and they evaluated each one. 
on the basis of how it helped them become the kind of people and family they wanted to be in the world. After talking for an hour and a half, they made their decisions. Girl Scouts was in, church was out. They could see the tangible difference Girl Scouts made in the life of their daughter. They had a harder time understanding, finding meaning from the participation in church. I think people are having that conversation all over the land, but rarely as articulately or intentionally. And if we're unsure, we just need to look at any one of the numerous statistics like this one that describe the decline of our faith traditions in this land, and this is only the last 70 to 2,000, the last 10 years have seen a decline of every major Christian tradition, Roman Catholic or Protestant, liberal or conservative, evangelical or mainline across the board. Which brings me to one of the primary things I want to say, because most of us look at that with a feeling of distress or concern or anxiety and often of shame. We remember a different church, a church that was bigger, a church that seemed to be growing and expanding, and we're not sure what to do, but we feel really, really bad. And so one thing I want to say up front and clearly, and if you remember nothing else of my 30 minutes, remember this. This trend and decline and loss is not your fault. It is not. Now, I always feel a little presumptuous making that assessment, but the fact of the matter is I've been blessed in recent years to be all over the country with congregational leaders, lay and ordained, and there is this pervasive sense of guilt that somehow this happened in our watch and it is our fault. It is not your fault. This decline, by and large, is the result of massive cultural change. More change in relation to the way we think about our participation in faith communities than ever before in the history of these United States. Four factors I'm going to touch on just briefly to, to frame some of the issues we're facing as a synod and as a people. The first is we've over the years lost a significant amount of cultural support. When I was growing up, when you were growing up, most of us, the cultural expectation was that you would be participating in a congregation. We enjoyed the support of the culture in TV shows and movies. Much of the faith was taught in our public schools. It is no longer that way. And I don't say that I want to be clear to either pine for a nostalgic past or certainly to intensify the culture wars in a multicultural world, in a world that's diverse in terms of beliefs and disbeliefs. I cannot imagine the God we know in Manger and Cross wanting us to foist our faith on others through the schools but rather to take responsibility for bearing witness in word and deed to the truth we have in Jesus Christ. We've also lived at a time where there's been a sharp decline in what I would describe as the culture of duty. The culture where people join things just to join, do things because they know they should. The church isn't alone in its decline, so are almost all volunteer associations. That kind of communal capital is at an all-time low. People now are motivated less out of a sense of duty and more out of a sense of discretion, a sense of knowing in this world of so many opportunities, they will choose the ones that are most meaningful, that they can make a tangible connection between their commitment and their life. This is exactly what the gentleman in the airplane was saying. We live at a time where there has been nearly the evaporation of any sense of Sabbath or even of rest. There is no 40-hour work week. There is no weekend that you count on. Think of the number of time-saving devices that have come down the pike most recently. Email, do you remember when we were told that email was going to help us save time? <laughs> like, really, we'd no longer have to play phone tag. We could just leave an email. Most of us now face this dilemma. When I go on vacation, I have two unhappy choices. One, I can check email every couple of days but never really get away. Or two, just unplug for two weeks, but dread coming back to hundreds of unanswered emails. There is no Sabbath. There is no rest, which means Sunday, church has gotten squeezed out for soccer matches and hockey games and all of the other things that we would like to do. 
Fourth and finally, we are drowning in a sea of stories. There were, as it was a time, decades, even centuries, where the Christian story held the center of gravity in the culture. All other stories connected to that assumed that. If you were to get an advanced degree in English literature, you would begin with the Bible, not as great literature, but because most of Western literature doesn't make any sense if you don't know the Bible. The Bible was the primary story undergirding our culture, and now it is just one of any number of stories. Narrative, but increasingly consumer consumption driven stories that we unconsciously advertise in the labels of our computers and our shoes, our shirts, our cars across the board. Increasingly, people find more meaning from the labels they wear than the churches they attend. In that kind of cultural milieu, facing that amount of significant change, no wonder so many of us feel like we've lost our compass, are having a harder time finding our way forward. So when I think about what it is to be in ministry, congregational ministry, lay and ordained across the board, a different kind of image comes to mind than the one I was taught 20 years ago. In fact, I came across this little commercial from a computer consulting firm called EDS that I thought kind of captures the sense, not only of me, but of a number of leaders I've had a chance to talk with over the last couple of years. This, I think, is what leadership in the church is like today. People like to climb mountains. I like to build planes in the air. Sometimes the temperature up at altitude will reach 60 below. It's brisk, it's refreshing. You never know what you're going to come across up here. Canadian geese, mallards, owls. These people back here, that's why I come to work. That's why I build airplanes in the sky. We're not just building a plane here. We're building a dream. I love this job. I've got a lot of banks up here. I look over there and I see that little kid, the look in his eyes, I saw the thanks I need. EDS, managing the complexities of the digital economy. I, I just find that one minute commercial so captivating and descriptive of my own sense of our task at being church, because the truth of the matter is, and just trust me on this, none of us really knows what we're doing right now. <laughs> we, don't, we don't. We don't. If I did, trust me, I'd be working on my second bestseller from Hawaii. <laughs> But we don't. The culture and situation has changed enough that we are reinventing and innovating and experimenting with faith and confidence that the Lord, who has always been three or four steps ahead of us, continues to lead us and has blessed even this group of people with the insight and the faith and the ability to discern the Lord's call here and now. So yeah, it's hard. It's challenging. It's cold. <laughs> Ministry as building airlines, airplanes in the air. Which brings me to the chance to talk a little bit about this partnership between the Southeast Penn Synod and Kairos to think together about a mission advancement campaign. Let me just say a word about Kairos and Associates. This is a group that's been doing research development consulting with Lutheran communities for more than 25 years. Over the years, they've raised more than $1.4 billion. Central to their work is the belief that discerning mission and vision is at the heart of renewal and movement. You cannot simply raise funds for mission unless you have a mission that is compelling and that you believe is God's mission for you. And discernment and development of that vision and of spirituality and of all of our work, understanding it as a calling from God is key. 
There are two huge pieces or movements of the work that we, are, what, that we are envisioning and imagining. Part one is to discern and clarify and articulate a vision of God's preferred future for the Southeast Penn Synod. That's the part that we are in the middle of now, and this is an interim report on what we're discovering. The second part then is if it feels good, seems good to us and the Holy Spirit, then to move forward in order to discover and develop the necessary resources to live into that vision. So I wanna talk a little bit about this first part, discerning and clarifying, articulating a vision of God's preferred future. Our strategy has been to listen deeply and to do that. As the bishop mentioned, we had three primary avenues approach over the last couple of months. We had the landscape survey that more than 480 people took. We had the two bishop summits with more than 60 participants, and we had interviews with all of the synod staff. Four things I want to hold up. Actually, there are a dozen things or more that we've learned and the synod council will be processing, but four seem most helpful to highlight today. First, we know as a body that we need to change. When we talked about do you believe the synod and the way it operates and move forward as congregation, the synod needs to change, 99% of respondents indicated that there were either small or large or even massive amounts of change that we wouldn't engage in. So yes, there's 1% thinking we're just fine the way it is. <laughs> but 99% of us know that we need to change, and more importantly, just as importantly, result of the landscape survey, we discovered that we have the energy and the enthusiasm and the vision to do it. I mentioned in the workshops I did yesterday that people change when they are ready to. Nobody can make you change. This body is ready and exciting and eager to live into God's preferred future. The second thing we discovered is that there's a powerful consensus that at the heart of our task of ministry right now is to strengthen our Lutheran identity. That is to think about what does it mean to be faithful Lutherans at this time in this world? How do we confess God's unrelenting mercy and grace in word and deed to the communities in which we are committed and invested right now? That renewal of identity rose to the top of the list of everyone taking the survey. The third thing we realized is that there is before us an opportunity to clarify the role of the synod. Now, if you've ever heard this kind of report before, you know that opportunity is a code word <laughs> for we have a little work to do. <laughs> there was less understanding across the board of just what a synod is. There was great appreciation, but not always as great understanding. The folks who understood the vision and the role and the mission of the synod most closely and most clearly are not surprisingly those of you who are participating in synod activities. In fact, there was a tremendously high appreciation by anyone who checked the box, I have participated in the Synod Assembly for events just like the Synod Assembly. You come away energized, you come away fed and enriched, you come away sensing how it is that this expression of the church is part of the body of Christ and how it equips you as an individual and your congregation to take those steps forward in faith. But we still represent a relatively small group of the Synod as a whole, including many of our church council, congregation council members. We need to spread the word, involve them more, and clarify what it is the Synod does, why it's valuable, and how it helps strengthen the identity of Lutheran congregations. And the key element of that, and this was another area of profoundly strong consensus, the key way to do that is to help us all realize that at the heart of this Synod's mission is the task to lead, but to lead by equipping congregations and leaders. And I have a stethoscope up there for a pretty uh, specific reason, because there's been an interesting change in the way we think about the medical field in the last 15 years that I think applies, that we can find some analogies to. It used to be you would go to a doctor when you were sick, when you had a problem, when you needed counsel or advice, and that was pretty much the only time you went to a doctor. And what we discovered after a century of practicing medicine that way is two things. One, it wasn't helping people stay healthy. <laughs> that is, you came to have things fixed, but you never learned how to stay healthy in the first place. 
And second, it became utterly financially unsustainable. The health care crisis in which we're in is a complete result of that model. I'll go when there's a crisis, when there's a problem. That's when I'll seek out help. So in recent years, I don't know if you've noticed, but when you're with your doctor now, whether it's for a problem or a well checkup, a word that didn't exist when I was a child, your doctor spends as much time discussing your current state of health as he or she does discussing ways that you can live more healthfully going forward. Your doctors become your partner in your health care, and you now bear a certain level of responsibility through exercise and diet or vitamins that you now have been commissioned into the role, and your doctor's chief task is to equip you. And the better the doctor accomplishes that role of educating and equipping, then the healthier you are, the healthier society is, and the more successful that doctor is. Right? That's a very interesting shift. We used to think doctors are the ones, we rate the effectiveness of a doctor in accord to how she or he is able to treat your problem. Where now we think about the successful doctor or practitioner as the one who can help you avoid those problems in the first place and lead a healthier life on your own. Just the same as the way we're beginning to imagine our life in congregations, and particularly as a synod. Because for a very long time, we looked at the synod when we had needs, we needed a new pastor, or when we had problems, there was conflict, whatever. We went to the synod as we would a doctor when we needed some kind of expert counsel. And what we discovered over the long haul was that was not making us stronger and healthier congregations. So this new role that's emerging that there's great consensus on is that we need synod leadership to lead and to lead by equipping us and accompanying us and encouraging us to be healthful, vibrant, witnessing communities of faith, engaging our communities wherever we are. Tomorrow, many of us in church will hear or read or preach on the story of the road to Emmaus, which I just have always found an inspiring and powerful story. At the heart of it, at the pivot point, are what I sometimes think are the four most heartbreaking words in scripture. But we had hoped. But we had hoped. I find those words so poignant and moving because they speak of a future that will no longer be. They speak of a future that is dead. I remember hearing once that Ernest Hemingway once was challenged. He was the master of the brief, succinct, short story. Asked just how short he could make a story. Could he do it with six words? He said he could, took the bet, and said, for sale baby shoes, never worn. The story is powerful because it speaks of a future that will never be. Many of our communities of faith are caught up in the grief of seeing a future they had imagined, of expanding buildings or program or staff that we know now will not be. But we had hoped. The story doesn't end there, though. The story moves from broken hearts to burning ones. Because those travelers on the road then, these travelers on the road now, discover that our imagined future is not always God's imagined future. Jesus, on that day, introduced those disciples to a future world and possibility that they could not have imagined. Their hopes weren't wrong, just not accurate. They had imagined a warrior king coming to redeem, and God was up to something better and bigger, new life, resurrection, redemption, something no one on that road then could possibly have imagined. God's future was bigger, and it is almost always not what we had expected. But we had hoped, that's the hard part, did not our hearts burn, that's the vision. 
Bishop Hansen reminded us yesterday that one of the hard things about opening your hands to do God's work is having to let some things go. To release some hopes and dreams and expectations, to let them go in order to receive that future that we had not imagined, but God is already planning for us and drawing us into. I know that creates a level of anxiety. We wouldn't be human if we didn't feel nervous peering ahead at a future that we cannot control. And we wouldn't be faithful if we didn't imagine that God was fashioning it. When I get nervous, when I get anxious about the future of our congregations, or our synods, or our seminaries, I find it helpful to remind myself that the earliest Christians, do you remember this? The earliest Christians weren't called Christians. They were called people of the way. People who knew they were on a journey, who had not yet figured it all out, who believed Jesus' words in the Gospel of John that the Spirit was not done. The Spirit would continue to lead us in time into all truth, that there is more to learn, more to discover, more to share. Now, sometimes that way is beautiful and pleasant and pastoral, just like the Brandywine River Valley. <laughs> Sometimes, though, it's less so. It can feel dark and foreboding and make us anxious. And at those times, our church has equipped us with a community of saints because we walk together into the future God has fashioned. And so I will ask you, as the community of saints, to pray with me a prayer that has animated and strengthened and encouraged the faithful for years. Will you pray with me now as we venture into God's preferred future for this synod, this people, this land? Let us pray. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, only that your hand is leading us, your love supporting us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Even more, thank God for you. Amen. <laughs>